tell us a little bit more about. Oh yeah, that. We're gonna record this meeting so that we can post it on, on YouTube. So thanks, thanks Michael for remembering that. I always forget. I'm uh, just too excited to get into the conversation. So so I'm um, gonna hand it over to Chris in a minute, but just wanted to contextualize this a little bit in just saying that, um, you know, Oak Park Neighborhood Association, we saw some, you know, of course we've been very close to the, the Big George campus for, for decades uh, and saw some recent news about some rezoning, rezoning happening on the campus. Uh, and wanted to reach out and ask and learn about uh, kind of what's planned and what, what some of the ideas are around campus growth and expansion and all the cool programs that you guys are thinking about bringing, bringing here to our neighborhood. So would love to turn it over to you, Chris, tell us more. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here uh, again. Uh, love this group, uh, love the diversity and the, uh, all the fun activities that uh, um, many of you are up to. Uh, as well as some of the serious business that's going on uh, in the Oak Park area. Um, glad to also hear that uh, Sean Rooney's on the call. I'm uh, very proud to be a recent uh, board member um, uh, appointed to the Oak Park Business District. So um, very excited about um, being on that uh, board uh, and working uh, with the uh, business members uh, in, in the Oak Park District. Um, I, while I'm starting to stage this, Adrian, I just clicked on share screen. I noticed I don't have host control. So if you could work on that for me, I'll, uh, prepare for a presentation that, uh, I'll soon be turning over to, um, Dr. Um, Sands and also to, uh, uh, Dr. Balachandran. Um, but first I wanted to just say that, um, Many of you know our Sacramento campus as the McGeorge School of Law. Uh, what many of you probably don't know is that we've been, uh, since July of 2020, um, integrating School of Health Science programs into that campus fabric. Um, we started back in 2020 with five new programs. Um, and I believe the School of Health Sciences now um, stewards nine uh, programs uh, over three campuses. Um, we have a long history of relationship between our uh, Arthur A. Dugoni School of Dentistry and our School of Health Sciences on the Sacramento campus. Um, the physician assistant program originally began uh, at the uh, School of Dentistry and then transitioned over to the Sacramento campus um, again, back in 2020. Uh, and now, as Dr. Sands had mentioned, uh, we're looking at another innovative uh, interdisciplinary dental and medical clinic uh, coming to the Sacramento campus to um, sort of share in that core value of humanistic approach to healthcare education and professional practice. So with that said, and at this time, I'd like to share my screen and, and turn it over to uh, Rupa, who could tell you more about our School of Health Science programs, what we've been doing since um, 2020 on our campus, renovating spaces and, um, and uh, uh, modernizing existing buildings, sort of growing in place, if you will. Yeah, you should have sharing capability. Okay, let me do that now. Looks good, we can see it. Oh, is it there? Um, am I in the right screen though? You see a uh, University of the Pacific School of Health Sciences. It's and not that presentation mode, but. Yeah, let me uh, try to change that into, I thought I had it into slideshow mode, darn it. But let me, uh, let me get there. Ah. If you go to the lower part of your screen, the lower right, I believe you should see the uh, icon down there that you can use to get into that mode. I thought I had it there. Yeah. Even if not, we can see it pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Well, I uh, I have it there, and I'm just missing the icon. I have it on my other screen here, but just uh, to the left of the negative plus sign there on the side. Uh, right, right, missed it. 
the left. Yeah, there you go. There. One. Yeah, I keep clicking that and it's uh, not transitioning over. I think it's because I'm in a, here, one second. Sorry for the delay. No problem. And let me go back to, here we are. Uh, there we perfect. go. Okay. So without any further ado, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Rupa. Thank you so much, Chris. And I apologize, I dropped off. We just lost power here in Oakland, but uh, I'm joining you from my cell phone. So if my picture is a little grainy, forgive me, but really excited to be here and talk about the School of Health Sciences. So University of Pacific has a strong uh, school and program of education in the health sciences. Uh, some of you may be familiar that we are a three city campus with campuses on Stockton, Sacramento and San Francisco. And on our Stockton campus, we have the physical therapy program, speech language pathology and athletic training as part of the School of Health Sciences in addition to a wide variety of other schools and um, colleges. In Sacramento, in, you know, you're all very familiar with McGeorge and the very strong impact they have on the community. And we are the new kid on the block on the Sacramento campus. We share some space with McGeorge. And in June of 2020, the University of Pacific had its own School of Health Sciences, uh, combining all our several of our health science programs into the school. And now we have nine programs that are up and running, five of which are on the Sacramento campus. And I will talk to you a little bit more about who we have in Sacramento. And finally, our Doctor of Audiology program is in San Francisco. Uh, and Dr. Sands is gonna share with you our big school there, the Daniel School, and more of that in his part of the presentation. But let me focus more on Sacramento and who's, who we are over here. Can I have the next slide, please, Chris? So the purpose of the School of Health Sciences is really to advance the lifelong health and wellness of our diverse communities. It is our strong belief that a healthcare education is one transformative way to improve the health of the individual, the family and the communities, and it can have a long lasting impact. And the vision for our school is an innovative school and an in, with an impact on the community, which is positive in order to partner with our community and generally be able to improve health and wellness within our communities. May I have the next slide, please? Chris? And, and hopefully you're seeing this in the Oh, pool. thank you. So, a little bit about, I, I'm good, I can see that. <laughs> We have 468 students and they're distributed over uh, an undergraduate program in speech language pathology, master's programs in athletic training, clinical nutrition, nursing, physician assistant, social work and speech language pathology, and three clinical doctorates in audiology, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. We have 52 faculty, 28 staff, and four clinics that serve the community. All right, next slide, please. So I would like to spend just a few minutes talking about the programs that are actually here on our Sacramento campus. Uh, clinical Nutrition hosts a master of clinical nutrition students are prepared to become re registered dietitians. And we graduated our first cohort in this December of 2021, 
and we do have the next cohort graduating this December and it's 20 students just in clinical nutrition first because March is National Nutrition Month and uh, we will share with you some of the activities uh, down the road of what we're doing for March and nutrition. May I have the next slide? Occupational therapy, the doctor, it's a doctoral clinical program. Uh, it's a three-year doctor of occupational therapy program, which prepares students to uh, become occupational therapists, definitely promoting well-being, healthy uh, individuals, and advocacy in a global society. Our first cohort of 37 students will be graduating in December of 2023. And the second cohort, number 2024 rolls around, will have well over uh, 70 occupational therapists graduating from the School of Health Sciences here in Sacramento. May I have the next slide? Nursing, this is a program we're very, very excited. Uh, the first cohort is gonna be starting April of this year, graduating in 2024. It is the, um, can you go back one? Thank you. It is the entry level Master of Science in Nursing and it prepares students for uh, registered nurse licensure and public health certificate. Uh, we're really excited about being here in Sacramento and having a beautiful training facility with uh, a lot of state-of-the-art training tools, which will really help our, our nursing students learn how to work well with whatever is coming up in the field in terms of technology and health. May I have the next slide, please? Uh, social work, our Master of Social Work program is a 1.5 year long program and uh, we graduated our first cohort in December of 2021 uh, with 16 students. Our second cohort has 26 graduating in 2022 December and our third cohort with 30 students is enrolling for fall. So our social work students, a lot of our students, uh, California, even more so from communities close to Sacramento, from within Sacramento. So it's wonderful to be to have students who come from our communities and who are gonna go back to serve our communities around us. And, and through that process, we see us partnering to improve the overall health in our community. May I have the next slide, please? Uh, Physician Assistant, this is a program that has been with the university for uh, a long time now, for about five years now. It is a 27 month program, uh, Physician Assistant. Uh, it's a master's degree, Master of Physician Assistant Studies, and the profession of Physician Assistant has really helped improve access to healthcare because it's a shorter program with intensive training, but it is able to provide a lot of healthcare for uh, individuals without needing to train individuals or a whole lot of individuals with the eight-year medical degree. So physician assistants really, uh, pro really fill in that niche to improve access to healthcare. Uh, we have 128 alumni out and we take 45 students per cohort. So once again, we're really excited about how this School of Health centered here in Sacramento is training students and really beginning to build uh, a strong program that will meet the needs of healthcare within our communities. And I think that those were my slides, Chris. Well, thank you, Rupa. And I I'm going to take this moment just to check and make sure that everyone's seeing a full screen of the slideshow and not um, yes. smaller signs. Okay, I want to check with you there. Uh, but I wanted to thank you, Rupa. I, I know you've lost power there, uh, uh, and it's uh, challenging sometimes to do these Zoom calls and, and manage uh, these curveballs that were thrown. So uh, appreciate you going through those first slides. And the next opportunity... Um, of slides I wanted to share with you as our Pacific Healthcare Collaborative. Um, as Adrian mentioned in the introduction of this um, uh, neighborhood meeting that there are signs being posted on our campus 
um, which is really um, an entitlement process where we are trying to apply to the city to conform our uh, current parcels to what we're uh, actually doing uh, on the campus. For so many years, it's uh, changed, but we haven't kept up with um, keeping those those parcels in line with um, with its use. Um, one of the signs that we are advertising is on the corner of uh, 5th and 34th Street. And what we're looking to do there is develop potentially a Pacific Healthcare Collaborative uh, in line with our uh, sort of history of, of the Arthur A. Dagoni School of Dentistry bringing uh, health science programs to Sacramento. So this is another in a long line of clinics that we've been sharing between our dental school and our new School of uh, Health Sciences. So um, with that being said, and, and kind of tying this into um, some of the development goals we have uh, in the region, um, I turn it over to Dr. Sands. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. And it is uh, a privilege to um, come to you. Uh, Zoom allows us to connect uh, in some degree uh, better than before in other ways, uh, not as good. I'm particularly happy that this is a Zoom meeting because I don't want the poison ivy that Dave would clearly give me if we were in the same room. So um, it's great to see uh, a community that works together. Having been involved in a number of things uh, in my life, to see a community with great, represented, uh, great representation is outstanding. Our desire with the Pacific Healthcare uh, Collaborative is to bring better health and health access to the Oak Park area and surrounding areas uh, that is what our focus is on. The dental school itself, and you can move the next slide, the, ne the dental school itself is in San Francisco. That's the building, seven story building close to Moscone Center, uh, recognized quite frankly around the world. A lot of people don't know that the University of the Pacific has a uh, internationally renowned dental school uh, with people that are involved with things all over the world. And I'm privileged to be a part of that. Just next slide, just the next little background. We're 125 years old. Um, so this is a, a longstanding uh, program. The humanistic model of education is one of our really key things. Uh, we, uh, believe that everybody intrinsically has value and that we bring that humanistic philosophy to everything we do. And part of that is clearly just related to the, the people around us. We care for 28,000 uh, plus patients. We give back, we do many projects where uh, a core value is giving back to our location and we do that actually around the state. Just some interesting information that uh, sometimes we're not aware of, um, but as a basic statement, people will see their dentist uh, twice as often as they'll see their physician. And um, about 27 million people will not see their physician that has seen the dentist. And the reality is, that we have a window into the whole body and can do tests and the mouth body connection, which uh, is really coming into focus this last decade or two is, is very clear. The evidence is there study after study. I mean, this is just a quick rundown. 47% of adults older than 30 years have periodontal disease. That's, that's just a fact. 4.5 times the chance for a stroke if you have periodontal disease, 2.6 times the chance of Alzheimer's, 30% greater chance of coronary artery, two to three times greater to have a heart attack. And we can do, for instance, in this mouth body collection, we can do uh, genetic tests in the saliva. And there are just about a hundred markers that indicate a propensity for certain things. And yet the reality 
in the health sciences is that everything has really been siloed. And our goal is, is, is real clear here. We're seeking to establish in the Oak Park area, the Pacific Healthcare Collaborative. This would be the first fully integrated collaborative teaching healthcare hub that will leverage interprofessional things, technology, partnerships, vendors, payers, and clearly the community. And that's why this is meeting in so important as we move forward so that we're interacting with you and getting your feedback because that is who we are as a dental school and as a university. So as I mentioned before, the history of health has been one where health schools have run in parallel. Um, they, they are siloed. Uh, and the fact is by not interacting in depth, the patient's health hurts. 27 million people in the US will have a dental visit, but never see the medical. Twice as many people will have a dental appointment rather than an appointment with their physician. So that's just clearly the history. Again, just a rundown that disease states that directly link to oral health issues, diabetes, stroke, CBA CB, CB, disease, autoimmune, and so on. So these are things that as a dentist, we can see and interact, but because we're siloed and um, we um, do not work together, we find out that the health of the patient is, is, is not as good. So our vision with the healthcare collaborative is to improve the clinical and educational outcomes through collaboration, bring better health, increase health access to Oak Park and beyond, prepare future dentists for lifelong success in a changing health and science landscape, collect, analyze, apply data to improve clinical health and outcomes, embrace, in, evaluate, and incorporate emerging technology, and create a model that may be replicated by other health science centers across the US. The reality is this is being tried by multiple, Harvard's trying it, UCLA's trying it, uh, New York University is trying it. It's being tried by uh, multiple medical dental schools, but the challenge is um, they're working with a structure that was still built to be siloed. And so uh, quite frankly, the dentist can't see the healthcare, uh, the electronic health record of the physician and vice versa. So we may not know the medicines that they're on. And so we know this interacts a lot. So the reality is the Pacific Healthcare Collaborative will bring together all of these things, including medicine, the various schools, and will be located right there in uh, Oak Park. We feel that is significant for the community and our desire is to be uh, fully integrated in the community. And this will be something that will make, uh, we believe all of us proud. So I'll kind of stop there so that there uh, is room for questions, turn it back to you, Chris. But uh, thank you for just allowing me to do a, a quick presentation and give you a vision of what uh, we would like to um, be involved in with you folks. Appreciate that, Bill. And again, I hope I didn't rush you through uh, clicking on uh, one slide to the next, but you you kept up uh, very well. And I uh, just landed on this uh, last slide, um, which is uh, again, showing that corner of uh, Fifth Avenue and 34th Street. Uh, there's actually two parcels there. One is um, already zoned commercial. The other one um, we're trying to rezone um, to commercial. Uh, to support this uh, collaborative uh, medical and dental clinic uh, on the corner, which would be situated right next to the Muddox building, um, which is uh, uh, um, the building right on the, along the storefront of Fifth Street, where many of our healthcare programs are in. So it's sort of creating that school of health um, that, um, uh, that is shared with the McGeorge School of Law on the campus. 
So I, uh, I'll end there and, and see if there's any questions or if I left you enough time, Adrian. No, this, this has been a, a really great presentation. I have learned a ton, uh, <laughs> in fact, and really just want to, you know, our job is to, to be a channel for neighbors to be able to have conversations with folks like McGeorge. And so I want to, you know, elevate, elevate any questions that folks might have. And uh, if not, I have some questions uh, for sure, but I really, really appreciated the time and, and the presentation. Look forward to working with you on this. <clears throat> any questions in particular? Michael. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, so great presentation. Appreciate that. Um, looks like um, uh, some really great things to come that could be really great for the community. And my question is always around access. So as far as residents here, I know um, UC Davis, they do some great things over there, but some of our residents aren't able to access uh, their hospital and their services. So wanted to know uh, what kind of restrictions there might be or any kind of barriers to uh, low income folks being able to uh, access some of these great services that you're gonna be bringing. So I'll just jump in. Um, we believe it will be fully accessible. It's one of our goals, one of our, our visions to be a part of the community and to treat the community. Uh, and they be a part of the team. So uh, I am not aware of any barriers that I have been involved in in speaking with, with everybody. So it will be a, a community-based healthcare um, collaborative in that respect. So I see no barriers. Well, Thank you. Just, just to, to build on that, Michael, uh, something that isn't known, which will, I think, indicate that there's no barriers. In our San Francisco um, uh, dental school, we provide dental care for uh, more than any other group institution for the Denical Medical group of people. So uh, you, you can go down to what medical schools, dental school, anyone, we provide the most. Uh, that is my full understanding, and I've uh, heard that from multiple sources that would not tell me that without being true. So we work to uh, tear down barriers, to be honest with you. Thank you. That's very reassuring. I appreciate that. Thank you. Let's go to Cassandra, then Dave. Yes, um, I too was um, impressed with the presentation and um, your opportunity to bring some of those services to um, Sacramento and particularly Oak Park. I have um, uh, one follow-up question to what Michael said and then another one about the development. So uh, will your services be provided by students? Uh, is, it so, is it sort of like a teaching or a learning clinic or will it just be fully staffed by um, full professionals? So I'll jump in, yeah, <laughs> if, ahead, if you don't mind. Um, we will be starting a full new, uh, I'm speaking now toward the dental side, okay? We will start a whole new cohort. They will not be people from San Francisco that come over and spend a week and then go back and forth and so that there is no real relationship. The cohort that we plan, we, we, we have, <laughs> The International Dental School of our dental uh, program of our dental school in San Francisco, uh, to be very honest with you, we get 600 to 700 applicants for 24 spots. These are some of the finest dentists around the world. It's very hard to choose. They, they come already as a dentist. We will be starting a cohort there. Uh, a whole new cohort there. And so they come to be further trained in the United States to get what I'm just going to say is the best training, but they come with a great deal of, of skill and knowledge. Trust me, we're able to choose from the best in the world that apply. That's just the fact, because I've been on the admissions program to understand. <laughs> And so our approach um, sort of on a development end, and I want to hear your second question, but um, the idea is to place those clinics on the first level where they're most accessible 
um, to the community. And then since we have an opportunity to, uh, to grow um, um, other programs on campus, since there is a need for, for additional space because our School of Health Sciences um, is getting uh, overwhelmed with applications for uh, student um, um, uh, or for, for healthcare professionals, we want to take advantage of this opportunity to grow um, uh, a facility uh, to, again, help with uh, an expansion of our physician assistant program, an expansion of our nursing programs, and some of our other schools. So um, as a part of that, they're involved and, and use this clinic as part of their training to help on the medical side. Uh, to assist doctors um, and and other professional nurses and get the training um, that that we could incubate uh, within our own schools versus them going to other hospitals or organizations and get that uh, that training. Okay, thank you. That's good clarification. And I think on my development side, so I, I'm very familiar with the Muddox building and the lot next to it. Were you saying that lot is actually two parcels? Or is there a second parcel somewhere? Um, just if you could clarify that for me. And then it sounds like the first floor would be more clinical. And how many floors are you looking at that would be more, I assume, classrooms uh, and no housing, right? Or is there housing? That's Well, first and foremost, uh, that corner lot, which is uh, a parking lot, uh, mm -hmm. has two parcels on it. Okay. Um, one parcel is zoned um, high density residential and the other one is commercial. So in order to um, develop the property, um, we would look to conform it all to a commercial zone, which is what the Muddox building next door um, is on. Um, the building um, paying attention to municipal codes and to uh, you know city ordinances with regard to setbacks um, and with regard to massing, we're uh, being very um, conscientious about how large we build and and how much um, uh, sausage we can fit into this casing. Uh, to be quite honest with you, so um, trying to make sure that uh, we don't uh, overstep our are welcome. Uh, we have not yet um, selected a design firm to work with us, so we don't exactly know um, how large yet um, that we would like to um, um, uh, take to the city and, and discuss with the planning departments. Um, so we're at the very early stages of just doing an entitlement, making sure that the zoning is correct and that we can you know, grow um, more dynamically uh, on our 13 acre footprint in Oak Park. Thank you. Yeah, I, I so I'm gonna paste in the uh, chat just something that came out in the Biz Journal. This was back, it, you know, this may be old information, but they, they did mention, you know, housing on, on two of the parking lot sites. And so, you know, just very interested in, you know, as a, as a community that needs more housing kind of, very interesting. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. And, and, and we first started off thinking that we could do a, a dental medical collaborative and somehow um, fill the void that we feel um, we have as, as a school uh, and, and the Oak Park area has with regard to housing. Uh, we quickly found out in sort of the pre-planning and programming that it, that would create just really too large of a facility. Um, our campus master plan in Sacramento um, at one point had housing focused on the southern end of campus uh, next to the Bimbo Breads facility. Um, it's where we already have uh, two uh, resident communities um, and one of them is, is quite uh, old and and probably have seen its its um, use of life. So if we were to do new resident housing, um, that would probably be the location that we would focus on. Um, after a campus needs assessment that we recently did, um, we recognize that we're woefully behind in providing uh, housing for our students. Um, but that would probably be 
another project and, and not a, a project that would be tethered to this project. Um, but it's something that we're aware of and, and we're working on to, to improve, um, but it wouldn't be on this particular corner. So I wanted to go to a couple of questions in chat and if folks have questions, please raise your hand. It's easier to manage. Um, but Rosalie, would you like to unmute yourself and, um, and ask your question about the, the old library building? Sure. So we're just wondering when you said giving back the, to, that you like to give back to the community, one of the heartbreaks that we experienced uh, right after we moved to this part of Oak Park was that the library closed down. We visited it once and then it closed down. So it must've been in the, we moved here in 93 to this house, just a few blocks away. So there's been no access to a library since then, so we raised our children um, driving to Colonial, um, but that's, we want, we want walkable neighborhoods. We wanna have those sort of resources. And just wondering if there's any plan to make that possible again. Well, I appreciate the question. And I know that there's a lot of history um, behind that, that building. Um, I, I recognize it's um, former library um, status uh, within that community. And, and now it's really being uh, underutilized, quite honestly, um, um, as a, a building that supports our technology and our um, mailroom and duplicating surfaces. Um, for the most part, the uh, building is, has been uh, closed to the university um, as well as to the public. We're trying to figure out what exactly to do with that building. We have uh, done some investigative work on um, its structure and its integrity um, and looked at um, you know, what costs would be to um, renovate uh, and or develop that piece of property, but uh, we have not taken any uh, strides in into doing so. Um, so right now it is a little nebulous uh, in what that building will do to serve the university or uh, to serve the Oak Park area. But, um, but I know that we have a history on the Sacramento campus with our uh, McGeorge School of Law uh, and now with our School of Health Sciences uh, to give um, services back. Uh, to the community. I know we have seven uh, legal clinics um, that we hope with, uh, that we help with uh, homeless and advocacy groups. Um, and again, um, we have different uh, health clinics um, that uh, we're either managing on this campus or other campuses, as well as the new collaborative that's coming to the uh, campus, hopefully. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, put it past the university to do something that's community-based um, in that building. Um, not sure if it would return back to a library, uh, but I could surely see it serving the community in one way or another. Let's keep that conversation going because I think folks will have a lot of ideas about util fully utilizing that building. <laughs> I'd appreciate the question. Um, before going to the folks with the hand raises, we did have a, a kind of a two-part question from Eric in the chat. Number one, just asking about parking accommodations for new construction. And then number two, um, anything about commitment to community investment, local hire or minority hire. So that's a two-parter. Well, appreciate that. Um, again, we're early uh, in this project. We're still in pre-planning programming. Um, we're trying to, um, look at the pro forma of both schools collaborative efforts on this to make sure that the debt service um, uh, is manageable uh, on on the building. Um, so I, again, very early uh, in its stages. Um, I will say that we've uh, looked at uh, UC Davis's um, Aggie Square and some of the negotiations they've had with a lot of the labor unions in the, the local area. Um, we've reached out to our city government uh, officials um, uh, to kind of take their temperature as to, you know, how we can manage um, this project within the community um, and engage the community um, um, 
trying to provide uh, local jobs and opportunities. Um, so we are going um, and, and doing that investigative work. Um, as it relates to parking, um, I'm very familiar um, with uh, what a building like this can do uh, in the community and what we don't want. And I fondly refer to it and just saw another report out of Santa Barbara um, that Chick-fil-A has, but I don't want the In-N-Out Burger or Chick-fil-A <laughs> uh, sp uh, spill out into the, the city streets with receiving patients or, or, or our clinic service. We're, we would try to manage that parking on site. Um, we don't want that to necessarily spill out um, into the community, and we feel we have other parking um, uh, uh, lots. Uh, that could handle uh, that overflow of parking on those lots. But again, that will require traffic studies and some engineering to, to prove um, that we can handle those numbers. Um, it's always an issue when you're under construction where to place your contractors and subcontractors um, uh, during the building. Um, we do have, again, parking lots nearby to, to handle that uh, parking um, sort of um, expansion um, uh, or ex um, uh, encroachment uh, on the city streets. Uh, and again, um, that's something that we'll work closely with our design firms and our uh, other design partners and, and, and contractors about how they plan on, on managing that uh, when we're closer to, to being under construction. Yeah. Sue, did you have your hand up or should I go to Dave? Um, yeah, just well, my question was on the same thing on parking and, and traffic, and I was happy to hear that you do plan to do a, a traffic study and look at the engineering. Um, so I would be a little concerned if you wait until too late in the process that you get all the buildings figured out and then you can't change anything when you realize you need something for parking or whatnot. So uh, if, as, as soon as... Um, it makes sense. I would dive in. Yeah, I appreciate that. And again, we're we're in the entitlement stages, um, and we're working with the city planning department to see if that, um, when that traffic study um, is submitted uh, to mm -hmm. them, uh, we've reached out to some um, it, civil engineering professionals and other professionals with regard to traffic and parking studies. Um, mm -hmm. So we're 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 investing uh, in that, whether or not it's required or not, it's something that we we want to know, so we um, uh, can can manage uh, that that traffic if and when um, this building uh, does develop in the neighborhood. We don't have a, a an issue um, with an oversight, and of course, accommodate people coming by uh, public transportation or cycling. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Dave, did you have something? Some of the questions I had had already been asked by some of the participants. Um, like, for example, Mr. Blair was asking about accessibility to Oak Park residents. And I was curious so, are you envisioning some type of outreach to members of the Oak Park community to? um to potentially be seen by some of the students is kind of like a like a teaching learning process where they get access to some of the programs that you intend to offer um if if so uh, can you offer a little bit more on that bill would you like to take that one how yeah and i'll then ruba can jump in um, yes we we work very close with the community around us uh, in San Francisco, um, we, we do uh, what's called a project homeless, all of the various things. We go to schools um, for education and, and letting people know what's available. Um, I went with uh, what your, the, the, the vice mayor, Jay Shinner, uh, I've met with him multiple times. And when he told me about the the one new place over there, the Q Street, I forget the, that uh, for, for homeless and, and so on, I've met with him and quite frankly, unrelated to the Pacific Healthcare, 
uh, have been working, uh, COVID-19 set us back, but working to, to have a weekend over there where we can help those people. And this is just part of our value system, okay? It is literally uh, philanthropic, um, means to us more, more, more than just giving money, it means that we give of ourselves, And so uh, our desire, like in San Francisco for, you know, literally 125 years is to be a part of the community, recognizing the community, giving back to the community, what, whatever it takes for that group. So uh, the answer is yes, Dave. And All right. Um, um, I'm also curious, um, you know, it's been a while since um, I was a student at McGeorge, um, but I'm not familiar with, um, you know, the student housing as it is currently compromised on the campus. How many uh, uh, student residents do you have that live on campus presently? You, you know, I, I don't know if I have the exact number, so um, I apologize and I can get back to Adrian with, with that exact number, but I believe um, it's right around 200 to 250 students that were, were able to house um, uh, on site. I, I think we have about 250 beds. Okay, and in terms of your um, master housing plan, what do you project or what would you like to see as you progress forward with uh, the development uh, and including these other programs? How many um, students would you like to see potentially be housed on the campus? Well, we we need to do that study and and kind of look at what those campus needs um, uh, look like. I know we consistently have a backlog of um, students that want to live uh, on campus um, yeah. and 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 um, you know be closer to their their studies. Um, uh, I I think um, that we could probably support. Um, uh, probably uh, the amount of students that we have on campus and and probably um, at least a 50% increase, if not more than that uh, on campus. So, um, but there's, it's very involved in how large we build because again, um, we would want to not only support the students that are there with newer, better housing and take care of some other sort of Achilles heels we have with wellness and recreation and, and maybe even some of our dining services and incorporate that into maybe one um, development where we can, again, um, uh, take advantage of, of that opportunity to, to um, uh, have a capital renewal, if you will. Um, but again, I'll, I'll try to look back at some numbers and, and get back to Adrian on an answer on that. But, um, but I, I can see the need where we could uh, almost double our housing. Wow, uh, exciting times for McGeorge. Um, the, uh, the programs that you're offering, um, do you think they're gonna be exclusively all day classes or do you think some of those undergrad programs will be also night classes? Rupa, would you like to? I'm happy to take that on. Typically, all our health science programs at this time, uh, with the exception of the undergraduate in speech language pathology, our master's and graduate level classes, uh, a lot of our health science programs are also accelerated because, as you know, one of Pacific's mission is to prepare uh, the employment ready for the workforce. So to provide a high quality education in the shortest period of time. So many of our health science programs are accelerated. So they tend to be daytime, uh, residential, uh, there will be some offerings of some degrees that may have an online component, but we do that, that is the nature of it. Also, our students will train not only on campus, but they also go through extensive field training experiences. And for that, they are placed in and around the region. So we have students who live, travel to campus, but then may live closer to where their field placements are. So it's a very dynamic uh, situation with health science students in that perspective. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I think, uh, and Eric noted in the chat, just, you know, about additional presentations. I, I think, you know, we, we as the Oak Park community really want to continue to be involved in this and, and really are, are excited by the, the planning uh, that's already been conducted and really excited to see, you know, the results of, of what's coming. And, 
look forward to working with you more on this. Really, really, really interesting and, and appreciate you sharing so much information and teaching us so much tonight. So well, appreciate the opportunity. And again, we're we're at the very early stages, but we want to engage uh, Oak Park Neighborhood Association uh, with, with some of our you know, bold ideas uh, uh, early. And then as things transpire with uh, city planning, and um, uh, we'll come back uh, and share what some of the things we're learning uh, as we get design firms on board, uh, happy to share conceptual drawings um, and, and take you through the schematic design process with us. Um, it's always the, the uh, the, the planning process that uh, can be the most challenging. And we want to make sure that uh, we're taking the, the appropriate steps forward um, along with the community, um, because really um, the University of Pacific uh, hasn't had this opportunity in a long time to, to develop um, and, and bring these new programs to the campus. And so we don't want to uh, um, uh, mess this opportunity up uh, in any way. So looking forward to your feedback and your input and your partnership. Thank you, Chris. If I may just add, if I can take one minute to say thank you for uh, giving us an opportunity to meet with all of you and we look forward to future opportunities. I know who we are looking at, the future of healthcare providers, our students are very eager. They really want to make an impact and I think an opportunity for them to work alongside and partner with you will lead to some very, very impactful results. So thank you so much for letting us be here today. And I will just ditto what Chris and Rupa said. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Rupa. This is wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, so now we're gonna we're gonna move on to our trustee uh, for the Sacramento County Board of Education. Uh, this is Bina Lefkowitz. Go ahead, Bina. Hey, how you all doing? Thank you for having me. I, I also have a PowerPoint, so hopefully this will work okay. Um, okay, so um, again, thanks for having me. I am on kind of on a mission to um, educate folks around what the county office does. And um, Sorry. Okay, there we go. So um, I was gonna check in and see how everyone's feeling today. If you wanna quickly put in the chat, how you doing? I know it's been a long day and we're getting on in the hour, but love to check in with people on, uh, oh, thank you, Adrian, for putting that up there. Uh, feel free to put it in the chat. So Adrian, you're smiley. I appreciate that. I, I figured you'd be uh, kind of a happy kind of guy. <laughs> um, Thank you, Patricia. Um, I think given all the time, given what's going on in the world, I think it's kind of good to check in with people on how they're doing. So this is my chance to check in with you all. Um, okay. Um, my, oh, there we go. Okay, so I wanted to just chat a little bit or just share a little bit with about who I am and um, I've been a trustee on the county board since 2017. Um, my background is in youth development. I've spent most of my life working to help adults um, learn, to help adults engage with young people. And someone has their, um, is not muted, if, if that would be okay. That's a fair, go for it. Okay. Um, and so most of my life has been focused on youth civic engagement and career pathway development. In the last few years, I've been focused on youth mental health. I've been a leader with Sacramento area congregations together for the last 15 years, doing a lot of advocacy um, at the Sac City Unified School District around social emotional learning and mental health supports for students. I happen, I do have the honor of teaching a class at Sac State to freshmen, and I also am faculty to the School Boards Association teaching other county trustees about good governance. So the County Office of Ed, uh, we see education as a way to empower people. And um, our mission is really to provide leadership, build partnerships, and to the end purpose of improving the quality of education. 
And we think about education both for adults and for students. Um, I thought I'd just share with you, there are seven trustees on our county board. I'm the area one trustee, they're in the middle, um, but there are seven of us. So I wanted you to just take a quick look and see, we cover the whole county. Every county has a county office of ed. Um, and what our board in particular does is, so we are unique in that we have a appointed county superintendent. Most county boards of education have an elected county superintendent. And so what we do as a board is distinct from what the county superintendent does. So we uh, do hire our superintendent. We act as a ju judicial appeal body for kids who've been suspend, expel, expelled and who want to appeal, appeal their expulsion. We also are an appeal body for parents who want to transfer their students to another district. And then we're also the appeal body for charter schools that get denied at a district level, they can come to us. The other thing that our board does by statute is we are the governing institution or the governing body for the juvenile hall and four community schools that we run. And those are for students who've been expelled or who have severe emotional disturbances. Um, and then, you know, we approve our budget and we work with our superintendent in partnership to establish goals. And you can see our goals there. The superintendent, on the other hand, has a distinct set of uh, mandated responsibilities. He runs the organization. He certifies the fiscal status of schools. And for those of you who have students in Sac City Unified, you're probably aware that he has not certified that district as having a solid fiscal status and he's working with them to improve that. And um, he runs, the, the main thing that our county office does is we provide technical support and training to school districts to improve the quality of education. And we do run a school of education. So anyone out there that is looking and wants to get into the um, education field, check our school out. We have, um, we graduate about 200 teachers a year and we do a residency program so you can get paid teaching while you go to school with us. Um, okay, so Adrian, I was thinking about what could I tell you all about the county office that would be relevant to Oak Park community. And um, so I did wanna note that we coordinate the adult education programs in the county. And so the in adult education, it provides free education for anyone over 18, anything from basic skills to English language skills to some career certificates. And I listed the ones that you can get at the Charles A. Jones Skill Center there. We do have some pre-apprenticeship programs. So we're really about helping people get ready and prepared to go into the workforce. Um, the Charles Jones Skill Center is you know, the closest skill center for adult education program for the Oak Park community. There's a link here to, so you can go online and at the adult education um, school link, uh, you can actually just go in, put your zip code and it'll tell you where there's adult education schools in proximity to where you live. And I did wanna just mention Sac City College and the set of career centers are also ways to um, help people, help adults in particular, find opportunities to um, get into a career and gain skills. I did wanna also mention that um, we provide support to high schools who are looking to develop career, career tech ed programs. And we have really been focused on the um, information technology and communications pathways, which have historically had not many low-income students engage with them. And so we've been on a mission to increase the number of low-income students who can have exposure to these ITC pathways. Um, and then I also did just share with you, Sac City does have a variety of career pathways. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. That might be of interest again, part of our effort to help um, bring young people and adults into the workforce. Now I'm gonna switch a little bit now and talk about our mental health in schools initiative, um, particularly given COVID, we think that um, this is a really, really critical initiative. 
50% of mental illness will show up in students by the age of 18. And 75% um, of mil illness, mental illness shows up by the age of 24. So having aware access to students and providing services while they're in school is really critical given those statistics. Also suicide is the number two cause of death in teens. And suicide um, ideation and calls for um, interventions for young people who are thinking about suicide is up nowadays, as particularly as kids have come back into school. So um, the whole issue of mental health in schools I think is really critical. And the, the, the initiative that our, we are working on at the county office is actually to place a social worker in each school. Uh, to date, we have about um, 20 social workers placed and our goal is 300 over the next five years, which um, is also brings uh, up the issue of getting um, sufficient workforce. So there are, I was really excited to see that um, McGeorge has a social work program. And if, if anyone's interested in getting into social work, we are working with um, the Employment Training Agency and the county here to create pipelines and pathways into the behavioral health field. And there's a lot of, lot of opportunities and jobs in that field. And there are definitely entry level positions as well as the you know, certified social workers. Um, I wanted to just point this out, help me grow. If for those of you that know of families or have family, a child yourself that's birth to age five that has any kind of, where you have concerns about their development, whether it's cognitive, physical, emotional, um, we have a team that will go out and uh, do an assessment of the child and work with the family to get services to that child. And this is a great prevention program and early intervention because we know we can help students who have start, who are starting out early with these um, concerns and problems. We can usually uh, provide good interventions so that they don't end up in special ed or having uh, further problems as they get older. And that's no cost, right? It's no cost. Yeah, everything I'm talking about here is no cost. Thank you. Um, and then I wanted to just mention preschool and TK. So the state recently adopted uh, a new effort to bring TK, which is really um, school for four-year-olds, like a pre-kindergarten type of situation. Um, so that is gonna be rolling out this year. And I wanted to mention it because I think you guys have like eight or nine uh, elementary schools in the Oak Park community. And the, um, the districts are the districts now are looking starting to plan for the rollout of this program and your community would be one of the primary uh, air districts one of the primary set of schools that would be eligible for this program and so I, I just wanted to mention it I you know for those of you who have children that are looking for child care and also for those of you who need child care in order to work um, this is, uh, I think this initiative is really important. And again, there's also going to be jobs created as a result of this initiative, uh, early, um, early childhood positions. So I wanted to mention that. And I want to just uh, spend a minute on the state seal of civic engagement. I have a lot of passion around civic engagement. The state recently adopted um, a seal where students graduating from high school can get a certificate saying that they are. Uh, qualify that they've um, completed certain types of civic engagement activities. Um, Sac City has recently uh, provided this seal for its graduates. So the graduating class this June will be eligible for the state seal. So just trying to get the word out to families. If they have students in Sac City that are in 11th and 12th grade, their students can complete certain activities and be eligible for this seal. But also we need community partners who can work with students and help them under, help them learn about community issues and offer them the opportunity to help be problem solvers in the community. And then um, this is probably one of the reasons I ended up wanting to be on the county board is because we serve kids in the community in juvenile hall in the community schools. These are often students who are would otherwise drop out. They're students who come to us with a lot of challenges. And um, we, I think, do a good job. We only serve about a thousand students 
unlike Sac City Unify, which has over 40,000 students. So we don't serve a lot of students, but we serve the students who really, really need support. And um, we are providing career tech opportunities for these students. We're looking at giving them college access early while they're still with us in high school. And we've provided, we've developed a scholarship fund to provide incentives for them to go to scholar, to go to college. And we provide a mentor as well as a scholarship. And that's pretty much what we do. And those are some other things, but I'm glad to answer questions and I appreciate your um, listening. I know it's late <laughs> and I know I'm passionate about this, but I appreciate um, you all listening and I'm glad to answer questions. Yeah, that was a really great presentation, Bina. Mm. Um, I'm curious kind of about the, I, I know this was just something touched on, but the, you know, the, the job centers and, and Charles A. Jones, and I know there's, you know, isn't La Familia opening their opportunity center, or at least they got 2 million bucks from the city to do that. Mm -hmm. How, how, I guess, what would that look like kind of within the scope of SCOE or how could SCOE support that um, program? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I, I, I guess they could apply to get um, access to some of the adult education funds. And Cassandra may have an idea on this. Um, I, I'd have to check, but I would think that they would, could become part of that whole collaborative around adult education. And um, like right now, I believe like in a school setting, you can offer like ESL classes. And if you have like 15 students, you can often get reimbursed for that class through the kind of adult education funding that's out there. Gotcha. Now it looks like Avery uh, has a question in the chat. Avery, do you mean, so she's asking, is there somewhere I can go to see the behavioral health opportunities? Do you mean job opportunities, Avery? Yeah, um, you mentioned being a, that there's like a pipeline for those who are interested in, I, I might have mis, misheard, but was it like social work opportunities with a pipeline for behavioral health positions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is there somewhere we can go for um, more information about that? And then also my second part of that question, are those opportunities you mentioned were entry level, um, are there opportunities available for, uh, to provide peer services? Yeah, thank you for asking. This is like, I love and am passionate, passionate about the whole issue of peer programming. Um, there are actually a lot of, in the county mental health system, they've created a classification called um, peer advocate. So when the county funds a provider to provide mental health services, they also fund not just the social worker, but they fund a peer advocate. And a peer advocate is that you have to be 18 years of age. Generally, they're looking for people with lived experience. And that's about all you need. And then they'll train you. Um, and there are lots of those jobs. If you go, just go online to like Indeed or just even put peer specialist, peer advocate into Google, you'll see there are lots and lots of jobs in the community around that. The other part of that is the state recently created something called peer specialist. So it's like the peer advocate, but it now is aligns with this new state classification. Um, SB 803 stuff. Yes, yes, okay. right, right, Avery. Okay, so um, yeah, so there, there are, um, if you're interested in the peer specialist, you can get trained up for free in our community through Cal Voices, and then you can apply to be, get certif certified. And then again, there'll be, I think more and more jobs in the peer specialist arena. Um, and then I would say outside of that, um, you know, I would probably refer you to SETA because they're actually facilitating an initiative with the county, with SCOE, with some of the um, mental health providers and with Los Rios and, and Sac State. And they've created a collaborative to build out the pipeline from high school to community college to college into the field. And we actually, uh, and I'm sorry, I'll end in one sec. We actually have um, money to pay stipends to pe to young people if they're getting their BA, if they're getting their master's. We, ha we, are run we have some grant money to pay 200 hour stipends, 200 hours of stipend to 
um, help some students who otherwise might not be able to volunteer to get their hours, you know, their hours needed to get towards their credential. So maybe you can just also reach out to me and I'd be glad to talk more with you. Yeah. Yeah, drop your email in the chat, Vina. Okay. <laughs> um, so everybody can get in touch and others. Uh, and then Sue is Sue's asking a question here uh, that, that kind of is related to a question I want to ask, which is kind of about SCUSD. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you kind of touched on like the, the money troubles and, you know, receivership is like that, you know, big scary thing that might happen. If receivership were to happen, would, what would SCOE's role in that be? What would that look like for SCOE? Yeah, so our superintendent uh, would actually become the trustee of the district. So we're, we're, he's working hard to make sure that doesn't happen because that generally doesn't, that's like really a bad situation. When he has to step in as trustee, that would mean that Sac City has no cash in the bank, period. Um, he's, he's working hard with the district. He has a staff person over there a financial analyst type person who is helping the district. He's helped them hire a really good um, chief financial officer. He's helping he or his staff person that's there is helping them set up better um, financial controls and data systems. Um, and he's basically our, our staff there are serving as kind of like if you were a person in debt and you needed like a coach to help you get out of debt, that's our role there. We're like, well, do you, should you be spending money on that? You know, what's the impact of doing that? Are there other options? That kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, he would be the trustee. Um, and the um, even though he's the trustee, you know, my understanding is the board then wouldn't really have a say. This is my understanding. They're the superintendent, I think, goes away, and um, but the union contracts still are in place. Gotcha. Any other questions for Bina while we have her? Well, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how some of these programs roll out, at particularly the the TK programs. Uh, that's that's really exciting. Yeah, I think you said it right. You know, we, there's a lot of opportunity, particularly for our neighborhood, to take advantage of some of those resources. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm always around. Just give me a holler. I'm glad to talk more about young people, students, SCOE. <laughs> yeah, well, we I'd love to have kind of go down the workforce rabbit hole, you know, a little more deeply. I think we had that in one of our previous convos to talk about, hey, how, how what's the interaction with SETA? What's the, you know, Urban League, all, familiar, all these all these other CBOs too. Like kind of how does, how does this whole holistic workforce system operate within the context of what you do so so let's 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 have that at a future meeting <laughs> and actually can i just respond to sue's question about where sac city and SCOE are different just another um so sac city runs its own district they have their own superintendent their own board they serve the forty thousand kids in that district they make all their decisions the county office of ed is like, a, we have 13 school districts in our county. So the county office of ed is like an umbrella, but we don't tell those districts what to do. We provide technical assistance and support. We make sure they're in compliance with the education codes. Um, in terms of the financial fiscal issues, we are like the watchdog, if you will. And we're making sure they're fiscally sound. And if they're not, we provide technical support. But we're kind of an overarching technical support agency that helps our school districts, our 13 school districts and our charter schools be successful. That's really our mission. Does that help, Sue? Yeah, so the cities that are unincorporated like Carmichael, uh, they, well, they fall under San Juan so that they're, they've, are, they've got a school district even though they don't have a city. I mean, unfortunately, the city jurisdictions and the school district's boundaries are all different. It doesn't matter. Like Sac City Unified actually has, is it partly in the county? It's It's got the city of Sacramento. It's got a little bit of uh, Rancho Cordova. Hmm. It's crazy. The, all the boundaries are crazy. Thank you. <laughs> Confusing. It is. 
Well, thanks, Bina, for joining us. And yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Really exciting stuff. Uh, okay, now we're so we're nearing the end of our meeting. We have three minutes left. Time for announcements. Who, who wants to share some announcements? Robin. Hi, yes, I'm Robin. I'm here with Assembly Member Kevin McCarty's office. I just want to thank everyone for their presentations. They were so informative. And I'm so glad to see all that's coming to the Oak Park community. I did want to do a quick shout out. I know we're short on time, but Assembly Member McCarty is gearing up for his Mother's Day donation drive. There are a lot of families in need this year. Um, we're partnering with the Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services. And I took a tour of the facility yesterday and they're doing an excellent job getting resources to our community folks here, especially here in Oak Park. They serve your area greatly. Um, what they're in greatest need, I went there yesterday, I saw there was tons and tons of infant and toddler clothing, but like this little small section of clothing for children for the elementary school age and above preteen. Um, so we really have a great need for children's clothes sizes five to 16. They also have a great need for pull-ups and larger size toddlers for 4T and 5T and also a great need for strollers. So we're going to be rolling out that event. I'm going to be sending you Adrian flyers when we get everything settled. We're going to be accepting donations in early April. We'll have bins at several locations in the district and also um, there'll be a time to drop those items off at the food bank. So I will keep you posted on that. And I'll also put my contact information in the chat. You guys can always reach out to us, all of your Oak Park neighbors. If you have any questions about state agencies, legislation, you wanna reach out and get some assistance with any of those things, please give us a call at our district office. Thank you for having me. It's been a great meeting. Thanks, Robin. Stephanie, then Rosalie. Oh, you saw me? <laughs> Great. You know, I've got stuff. I have stuff for you. <laughs> I just wanted to share something very much uh, that's going to be family oriented, and we're glad to bring it back. It's called Easter in the Park. That's going to happen on April the 16th at 4040 4th Avenue Park. It's going to run from 11 o'clock till 2 p.m. I'm happy to say that we'll be um, working directly with, of course, City Church, Community Wellness Forum. District 5 and the Night Market Series. So this is gonna be really huge. Uh, we love to have uh, the kids out just Easter egg hunting. We're gonna have the police department there to share um, the fire department and all the works. We're actually bringing vendors in this year too. So it's gonna be fun along with DJ. Uh, so come and join, it's free. You'll see posters going out soon. And again, it's going to be April the 16th from 11 o'clock till 2 p.m. So thank you. Stephanie, as you know, I, I live across the street, so all easy for me to get there. <laughs> you Can you put that information in the chat? And I expect to see you there. Yeah. Sure, I absolutely can. Yes. All right, let's go to Rosalie. Thanks, Rosalie. We see what you posted in the chat. <laughs> Oak Park Fix It Cafe. <laughs> Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm managing a lot of children and I was trying to um, do that at the same time. Um, yes, so just so for people who don't know, the Oak Park Fix It Cafe is um, an all free event where we neighbors come together. It's just sponsored by the neighborhood. A bunch of neighbors come together, help people fix stuff. We've got electrical repair, bike repair, face painting, knife sharpening, sewing. Those are the, the main things that we do. So bring your bring your broken stuff and come and uh, join in. It's a super cool community event. Thanks. Thank and you. it's March 12th. You saw it. It's in the chat. March 12th, 11 to 2 at the Oak Park United Methodist Church, right next to the Oak Park Brewery. All right. Sandra. And then Matthew. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, as I was listening, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's a lot going on. This Sunday, movie matinee at the Guild is free for families and adults. We'll in honor of um, Women's um, Month. And, and also, um, uh, we'll be showing hidden figures. And so that will be great at 2 p.m. this Sunday. 
And we do movie matinee every first Sunday um, at the Guild at two. And then the next weekend on Saturday is Let's Oak Park Read. So if you have or know of children between the ages of six and 12 and the ages, we are doing um, a book reading at the Underground Books at 10 o'clock on Saturday. Uh, that would be Saturday the 12th. And they get to read the book, uh, do build a rocket, and then they get to take a book home with them all for themselves. And the parents even get to engage in reading activities and, and get a book as well. So that's it for now, but lots of stuff happening at the Guild and Underground Books. Yep, comedy night on March 26th as well. <laughs> right. I saw you put that in the chat and that's what reminded me. Oh my goodness. Lots of good things going on in Oak Park. What's going on? Matthew. Uh, if anybody's been trying to plant some seeds from the library, uh, I was just there recently and they're completely out of seeds. That being said, Find Out Farms has a free seed box. So if you want to come by and browse the free seeds, or if you know anybody who is a gardener who maybe doesn't have access to some seeds at the store, they can come by, pick as many seeds as they're going to plant, go through our list. And if they want any gardening advice, that's free as well. Every Friday, two to seven, drop off your food scraps so we can compost it. Thank you. All right. Any other announcements before we call it? Usually Michael Blair has announcements, so I'm surprised he doesn't today. <laughs> hey, none tonight. Yeah, I'm empty. But All I think right. we're, uh, we filled it up. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, hey, this has been really, really eye-opening, really good meeting. I uh, appreciate everyone for making the time on a Thursday evening. So uh, I'll be following up with materials from everybody, and uh, we'll post this recording to YouTube and share it out. So thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.